Okay, so we are here to talk about uh, 100 gig uh, networking. Um, this is some new cool stuff that we've been investigating. Uh, we both work for a financial company in Chicago and we operate a lab where we test uh, newest gear that comes out and we also interact with the vendors and make sure that the new products uh, satisfy the requirements of our companies when we want to deploy this stuff. And uh, so, um, Fernando uh, is working hands-on with this stuff and he has a practical experience how these things work and I'm more the uh, old kernel developer that does the architectural stuff, so I'm more hands-off. Uh, but uh, I can tell you the story how all this, all this goes, comes together. <laughs> Fernando was going to give you the details on measurements and things like that. And uh, if you have a question, um, just say something. I, I like interaction with the, dial, with the audience. I really don't like to give monologues up here. And I'll try to look into your faces, and if I see you're bored, I will speed up. If you're interested and make some kind of a movement, I will exp explore the area more, okay? <laughs> So, um, why are we doing this? Um, the, uh, cap the capacity and the speed requirements uh, keep on increasing uh, for data links. Uh, this is true for, especially for wide area uh, providers, um, like tele telecommunication companies and stuff like that. Most of these links today are 10 gig, and uh, so for one fiber you have 10 gig going across that. With 100 gig, you can modulate 10 times that amount of uh, data on the same link. And so the same infrastructure would support a capacity of 10 times more. And right now we have a, a large uh, uh, amount of work going on in the telco to uh, uh, change the uh, basic speeds from 10 gig to 100 gig because of with the more the higher efficiencies. The other thing is uh, that uh, 100 gig now uh, is possible because at this point, uh, most of the hardware that we have today, uh, the processors, uh, the, the Broadwell, Intel Skylake processor, uh, get to the point where they can actually sustain 100 gig uh, data reception to memory. The earlier processors and even the Broadwell sometimes struggles with these speeds and so uh, if you have a, a memory subsystem that can not take the data in from the network, then you probably shouldn't be using this. But we're getting to that point now, and it's very interesting because now we have uh, uh, basically the fact that the uh, network speed follows the saturation speed for the uh, memory subsystem, sort of, and there's a kind of a correlation now going on there. Um, then uh, we have also development now of uh, a huge amount of machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms that learn on their own, extract new information from data. And this is called machine learning, and the machine learning is, is better the faster you can go through the iterations and the more data you can process. And uh, for these things, uh, for clusters of, of compute, with 100 gig you can bring them much, much closer, you can have much more data uh, that can be exchanged between these algorithms, and therefore your machine learning is much better if you uh, have a higher speed interconnect. And so high-end deployments uh, are going on this year now. Uh, a lot of the uh, new research uh, clusters that are built in the United States are on 100 gig in one form or another. And uh, they have also the corresponding processors and there are some pioneering projects going on from various companies that also compete with one another. Then there's also the uh, US Department of Education. Uh, they are funding uh, new developments in the computer industry, and there's this vision of the exascale computer for 2020 that has been around now for more than a decade. And so the intent is to build a much more powerful supercomputer that can do uh, one exaflop uh, of, of computation. I think we are now at uh, 100 and you know, 200 petaflops. So we're gradually going to that. And in order to get there, we need to have many more computational elements that are much closer together and communicating at very high speeds. And this is one of the key components that will enable this exascale vision of the Department of uh, Education. And therefore, there's also funding available from the government. And uh, this is uh, being looked upon as a strategic investment by the government in the area of supercomputing. And uh, if you look at the side here, there's another diagram. Uh, where you can see which standards for Ethernet uh, are, are deployed uh, in development. So we had the 1980s, where we had the 10 megabit, and actually most of the Ethernet standard was designed for 10 megabit. Then we moved to 100, um, around 2000, we get into the gigabit, gigabit area. Um, 10 gigabit Ethernet is, I think, widely deployed these days. 
uh, came about uh, about a decade ago. And then we have 100 gigabit elements now provided by, by the van providers. And uh, there's the um, expectation that we're going to end up with 400 gigabits per second by the end of the decade. And there are fractional uh, elements here of uh, 50 gigabit and 25 gigabit that are also going to be important for the development of the uh, higher, sp higher speeds. So, um, what kind of technologies are available for 100 gig uh, networking? So, uh, the question is how much can you sp put on a, on a strand, uh, of a fiber strand, and, and things like that. So, there's an old standard called the CFP uh, standard, which requires 10 links of 10 gig each. That's actually working with the existing old infrastructure of the telcos. If they just give you 10 strands, they can put 100 gig on there, and that works. That has been out there for more than a decade now. Uh, so, uh, that has been in use, in, uh, in use for one of our specialized long distance uh, uh, applications. It requires huge uh, converters at each end, and uh, it's a lot of effort, it's very expensive. The uh, new standard is uh, doing four strands of 28 gig links, uh, which is called QSFP28. This is comparable to the QSFP standard. QSFP, basically, with 10 gigabit, is the 40 gig standard. And this is the evolution on that one. This requires higher modulation on the wires, and that gives you the increase in efficiency that the uh, long-distance pro uh, providers seek for, and also gives us the, the ability to closer uh, uh, network the uh, components of a cluster together. Um, so, and this brings down the prices of the stuff from uh, uh, these huge uh, gizmos down to the small transceiver that you know from the 40 gig standards and the 10 gig standards, and that will fit into each server because there's this huge hundred, 10 times uh, 10 transceiver really can't be built into a host. It's mostly a, a termination equipment. Uh, so um, this is actually making it feasible, making it cost effective, and uh, uh, making it possible to deploy for a cluster. Um, then there are various standards to use for 100 gig networking. Uh, usually what comes first in uh, networking at a speed is InfiniBand, or well, maybe two to three years ahead of the curve. Um, this is standard, the standard that was pushed by the Mellanox uh, Corporation, and uh, they uh, have uh, switches that allow transitioning from lower infinity band speeds to higher infinity band speeds in their switches also exist, and it seems that this is the most mature technology that's uh, in existence today, and uh, all the stuff is available, and most of our testing focuses on the 100 gig solutions from Mellanox uh, uh, for infinity band. Um, then Ethernet. Um, well, there's some early deployment of server-to-server -server communication in uh, 2015, uh, but the deployment was focused there on just using the uh, Linux network stack, which gives you results in some kind of limitation on the speed. Uh, the company that deployed it was very much uh, against uh, using uh, offload capabilities, and so, and, but it was one of the major companies, and so a lot of effort went into just getting the basic uh, POSIX stack right and doing 100 gig uh, Ethernet from the network stack. Um, the switch that was used for that purpose uh, had some issues, and the early uh, switches were recalled and reissued in March, and hopefully they're fixed now. Um, there's some leaks under development, um, but they couldn't get any uh, um, uh, NICs for 100 gig in time, so they used the EDR switches, the EDR NICs from Mellanox, because they can also be switched in, into an Ethernet mode. So what, the, what came up with was a large deployment. There was uh, basically uh, Mellanox NICs in Ethernet mode with a specialized Ethernet switch. And so this actually has been resolved now, and I think it's no more mature, and probably now it would be the time, if you want an Ethernet fabric of 100 gig, you can do this. Um, then there's Omnipath, uh, that is Intel's solution of InfiniBand. They're trying to challenge Mellanox and take over the, the uh, area because they see it's very important for the future for this exascale vision of the government and uh, for uh, machine learning, and Intel really wants to get into that area. Um, so they redesigned the serialization and uh, made it compatible with InfiniBand. If you have an InfiniBand app, you can run on Omnipath. It supports more nodes because uh, the infinity band limit is, I think, 16K or 10K nodes, and the exascale vision calls for 100K to a million of nodes of, of compute. And so, um, and of course, there was these claims of production readiness, but uh, we had some issues, a lot of issues with our testing, 
and we thought this was going to be more an alpha uh, thing. And um, it seems that Intel is going to be wor reworking that, that uh, Omnipath solution and it's probably come up with a new version next year. And we hope that that one will be much better and will be much more competitive with InfiniBand. Then um, the, the form factors. Uh, here we have the, the CFP factor, 10 times 10. That has been around for a long time. Uh, then that would require a lot of power and, and uh, complexity to handle. Then the CFP2, a kind of a shrink of that. Um, then the CXP, which is the, another shrink of it, uh, and, and it almost turns to a form. And then there's a QSP FP28, which is a new connector that you're used to, also from 10 gig, looks the same way, works the same way. And uh, with that, actually, we can uh, upgrade our existing things to 100 gig from 10 gig. Then once the 100 gig was actually out, people saw, okay, it's four times 25 gig. We don't really want 100 gig to a, to a server. Most of the servers are old. They can't take 100 gig anyways. So the idea was, um, all right, um, we, we want to have a high fan out, and we have these switches with lots of ports, so we're just going to use splitter cables to split this thing from uh, 4 times 25 into uh, 2 times 50 or 4 times 25. So we have a, a huge fan out. Um, so there's, that's resulted in the approach of uh, 50 gig, um, 2 25 gig uh, links or 1 25 gig links uh, for, uh, uh, to increase the density of those ports. So then Thus, the switches typically handle 32 links of 100 gig, 64 of 50, and actually 128 links of 25 gig. This is a massive amount of, of servers that you can bind together with just a single switch. This has never been seen before, and um, this makes it very uh, easy to, uh, if you don't need a full speed, you can use this to scale in quite, quite a nice way. Um, so, but it was late, and so the vendors got ahead with this uh, before the standards uh, were completed. So this year, they finally completed the standards. Hopefully, I haven't heard of that one yet. Uh, so uh, the 50 gig is also in the works, probably completed by 2020, hopefully. Um, and this may be the default in the future, uh, because storage speeds and memory increases, and so it's, it's, it's a convenient compromise here. And then the... What happened then is, okay, they had a QSFP28 connector with four strands. They dumped it down to a single strand, and that then gave rise to the new connector standard transceiver SFP28, uh, which is uh, the same way, looks in the same way as the SFP connectors, just has more uh, rate on the wire. All of this allows you an easy upgrade path from the existing 10 gig deployments to uh, 25 gig or 100. And we have some interesting cabling here. Uh, the, this adapter is basically a QSFP to SFP28. You see, cable goes into the switch, the other end has four ends of 25 gig each. Uh, the, so this gives rise to a couple of, of these connectors here, QSFP to QSFP, and the, then the octopus connector here. Um, so somewhat on the switches that are available. Um, for InfiniBand, we have the, an ADR-based switch with 36 ports, and this was actually ready in the first quarter of 2016, called the 7700 series. Uh, those cannot be split. InfiniBand doesn't have the capability. They uh, bind these ports uh, strictly together. Then Broadcom came up with the Tomac chip, and this actually is able to be split down to the 25 gig uh, uh, segments. And this was first released uh, in fourth quarter of 2015 with issues and was then re-released. And uh, the Tomac chip is, is built into various switches by numerous vendors and sold in various form factors, but you have the same underlying uh, uh, switch technology from all these vendors. And then there's uh, the Menox Ethernet switch, which can be split into the two, uh, two strands. Um, because it's, the, the, the 25 gig was not considered viable. It was also delivered in 2015, and there's continually firmware improvements with that. And it's called the Spectrum switch. And then Intel has the Omnipath uh, switch with 48 ports. It had to be higher than Mellanox. And um, this was uh, released in the second quarter this year, and it's called the 100 series. So this is the basic form factor. Now let's see what actually happens here. Um, let's look back at what we had before. Uh, in the area where it had 10 megabits, so uh, there was about 100 nanoseconds per bit that you get there, right? 
And if you wanted to receive an MTU size frame of 1500 bytes, it takes 1.5 milliseconds. Um, so the time for a 64 byte packet is 64 microseconds, and you can receive about 10K packets uh, per second. So 64 microseconds is a sufficient time to process a packet and uh, send it back and do something with it. No problem. Um, that was how, uh, for, for what PCP was designed. Then we move into 100 Mac, and so now it just says 10 nanoseconds per bit, um, 150 uh, microseconds for a large packet, 64 for, for, for a small packet. Um, so can, we can receive 100K packets per second. And so per 10 seconds, we can maybe get two things. For if we get small packets. If you have small packets, we may not be able to process them fast enough because I think it takes about five to 10 mics to process a packet. Uh, but that buffers out very well, so fundamentally we didn't see an issue there. Um, then we get to, what, to one gig, you get once a nanosecond per bit, and now the time for a 64 byte packet is 640 nanoseconds. Um, so you can receive a million packets per second, and now uh, in a 10 microsecond frame, you can receive 20 packets if they are small. So uh, at that point, the uh, kernel and the network stack is not able to process this anymore. If you send a large amount of small packets to Linux, uh, you will cause, uh, at some point, uh, an overrun, and uh, the system is not able to handle it, or you get into a high latency mode. So that's where the problems start. And usually with this one gig, we can buffer that. This is only true for very small packets. So hope, let's hope that the, most of the packets are higher size, maybe 1,500 bytes. And there we still have 15 microseconds to process a packet. That's good enough. And if there are small packets in between, we can buffer that and it works out. Um, the application can still handle that. Uh, when you're going to 10 gig, now we, the situation gets gradually worse. worse. Um, uh, with 10 million packets per second, for, of, uh, if they're very small, this is a, a huge problem. We can't really generate so many interrupts. We have various techniques to avoid interrupts for, at that point. Um, if you get large packets, in 10 microseconds, you can get six packets of largest frame size. You can't process this anymore. Therefore, in the 10 gig time frame, we've added a lot of uh, additional hooks to the kernel to distribute the packets over multiple cores, um, to do buffering, make them bigger when they actually get to user space. So all sorts of fancy things are going on to uh, remedy the situation and still be able to receive the uh, full bandwidth and make use of the full bandwidth of the 10 gig link. So um, now we're going to 100 gig, and the situation gets uh, absolutely catastrophic here. Um, so. Um, uh, and 1500 byte packet takes 150 nanoseconds. There's no time for you to process that. You can get 60 of those of the ma maximum packets when, within the 10 microsecond window. Uh, you will never be able to process this stuff at full speed. So um, this means that uh, the existing mechanism and to compensate for this that we introduced in the 10 gig time frame must even become more sophisticated or we must find other ways to process this data. So um, then we have flow steering added. Uh, so this is the system, so the NIC can figure out which network streams are coming in, to which port are they uh, destined. And so the, the packet does not enter the network stack because it is pre-selected by the NIC for a certain processor, for a certain socket. So the uh, action of the host is taken out of the critical data path. The critical data path ends up in user space directly via a different queue, and that avoids serialization and causes us to be able to support concurrent rates that finally aggregate to the full bandwidth of a 10 gig link. But note, but no individual process or individual core is able to receive the full bandwidth now because there's still a lot of kernel processing, even though it's not serialized anymore, that is probably on the range of three to five microseconds, so you can't really receive uh, full bandwidth. So a lot of applications in the 10 gig, time, 10 gig area are uh, uh, trying to split the data streams in order to uh, receive the, the stuff in the correct way. So we now have a switch light logic on the chip, on the NIC. The NIC uh, routes the traffic to a certain core in order to avoid serialization on a central resource. And here are some time frames of um, what you need to do here. Ne main network access, main memory access takes 100 nanoseconds. And remember, it takes 150 nanoseconds to, for a 1,500-byte packet to come in. Um, this is a bit bad. So a random access to a memory location takes uh, it's, it's 64 bytes, and you have 1,500 bytes coming in. So you can only do that when you stream to memory. 
Then we have the uh, Hanukkah Geek Nix that we actually worked with, uh, the Connectix 4 adapter. Uh, it supports an EDR and Affinity Band, uh, Ethernet, and has very sophisticated offloads. They have tried to do what they could to improve on the existing flow steering scheme. The NIC actually has a flow steering macro language where you can program the chip to do various funky things with the, with the packets so that you don't hit the kernel for serialization. Um, so this also is multi-host. So the interesting thing now is that if you have a dual socket processor, since we have the problem getting into one of the sockets, this, we have changed the PCI standards that, that some pins go to one socket, some to the other. If you put the NIC into a machine, it can distribute the load over the two sockets and can basically service two uh, uh, processor chips at once. That is just a common business uh, arrangement. There, there's also the business server arrangement. There's also uh, actually it has the ability to do four uh, processors at the same time. So you can uh, dish out various uh, PCI pins put uh, maybe, say, two Xeons there and maybe two ARMs or a GPU, and it can, do, can serve all of these and do hardware routing to, the, to each processor. So the, the NIC becomes a very sophisticated switch into the, that forwards data into the memory of various uh, processors and attached uh, uh, things. And this is, yeah, because you are easily overrunning the stuff. Then we have the inter omnipath adapter. This is focused on MPI. It does omnipath only. And uh, here we have a redesign of the InfiniBand fabric uh, to remedy all the deficiencies that we have seen in the last few decades. On that one, and it's then called a fabric adapter. It supports more nodes and larger transfer sizes than InfiniBand. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it is its own protocol only, so uh, you're entering a, you must enter the OmniPath world if you want this, whereas with the Connectix 4 adapter, you can play around with Ethernet and uh, InfiniBand and do various other things. So um, how do you actually work with this stuff? Um, there's a socket API that you usually use to send message, receive message, and stuff. Uh, there is a huge amount of applications that run using this API. And uh, the largest set of developers know how to use the programming language. But yeah, with the socket API, you are relying on kernel calls. And that limits the uh, throughput. And there's a block-level file I.O. There's another POSIX API. Um, there's stuff like NFS, which can do NFS over RDMA. There you can basically say to the kernel, okay, I'm mapping this area, and NFS over RDMA does direct transfers from, mem uh, from another host into the memory of a system and does not buffer in the kernel. The usual socket APIs uh, assume that you receive buffers in kernel memory, and then you copy the buffers into user space memory. And that is uh, an additional latency that, does not, uh, that makes it impossible for you to actually process the data while it's being received. Um, so this is kind of an intermediate step. And then we have the RDMA API. These are one-sided transfers. You say, OK, I have this memory area available, and tell the NIC, OK, you can transfer at liberty into this area uh, without putting it into the kernel first. And this allows you to receive large amounts of data directly at full bandwidth into memory. And uh, the higher the speed goes, the more you actually have to rely on this, these RDMA APIs to do direct um, transfers and you basically talk directly to the hardware, you can avoid system calls with this stuff and avoid the overhead there. And that actually allows you to, to take very high volume data streams into memory. Then uh, a new API has been developed called OFI, mostly by the Intel engineers. They want to have a nicer thing going on than the ADIM API, which is said to be very difficult to program. And so the OFI is an API to interact with the fabric in more in an optic-like fashion. Um, it's pretty new, and we're not sure where this is going yet. And then the last solution is um, maybe we just don't want to deal with this stuff uh, at all in an abstract way. We want to directly program the, the chip and the registers. And with DPDK, you can get the uh, registers of various NICs directly exposed to user space. You can manipulate those things, and then you can do whatever you want. Uh, that is for the hardcore who want to mess at the lowest level. Um, the RDMA API still has an abstraction layer. You, is this a defined way of how you interact with any hardware that does support the, the, these transfers? But the DPDK is basically, you are on the register level and you can directly program and have full freedom. And some people see this as the ultimate uh, solution here. So if you try to use the socket API with 100 gig, um, if you have a fast talker, 
it's easy to overrun the buffers. You can, in a very short time frame, transfer a few hundred uh, megabytes or gigabyte into memory, and this will overrun any reasonable configuration of buffering that you have in the kernel. Um, then you can use the flow steering of the socket API to scale and have multiple processors serve the same NIC, bypassing the centralized uh, uh, queue there. Um, we also can generate per processor queues for sending, so that on this sending action also does not require a centralized submission queue. So every queue sends directly to the NIC, which uh, increases the sending speed there. Um, then we can exploit offloads to send and receive large amounts of data. So kind of we can give it a 64K buff buffer. The uh, NIC will hack this into pieces, 1,500 bytes each, to make it compliant with Ethernet speeds. So there are, there's numerous tricks that, you, uh, that are there and you may have to be aware of and that you have to be configured correctly. Um, then if you use a protocol with congestion control, uh, you want to be able to use the full bandwidth because... Uh, the, the TCP and stuff like that is really not developed for 100 gig. So what in practice you see is uh, bursty behavior that causes long latencies, and uh, then uh, yeah, you're going to fight with the congestion protocol until you have something that actually works well. So a lot of people just use UDP or forget about congestion uh, completely. Um, the, uh, also, if you want to have socket socket APIs, you can't use this on uh, on the Fabric APIs of uh, Intel or on uh, InfiniBand. Um, there is an, an implementation that emulates Ethernet on top of InfiniBand, but it has various non-Ethernet-like semantics and is full of surprises. If you want to try that, it, most of the stuff will work, but then you have to probably chase down some details there, here and there. So the InfiniBand uh, API, RDMA API, is based on you have a somewhat of a network and you have buffers registered with a NIC, and the OS is only on the side. It facilitates the permissions to the memory. It uh, sets up the connection and stuff. And then uh, one app can directly say, OK, this memory range is now transferred to the remote host. And it will automatically do that directly without OS intervention, uh, memory to memory. And that will allow you to over override the overhead of the uh, kernel stack and go direct from uh, memory to memory. And that actually allows you to use uh, the full capacity of what your memory subsystem and what, your, what the network uh, can offer you. And there's also, uh, this is actually natively InfiniBand, but later there was uh, a, vari a, variety of, a variation of this developed on Ethernet called Rocky. Uh, this allows you to do the same thing with, with uh, Ethernet. So, uh, and that's a Rocky uh, original was not routable, and Rocky version 2 is routable. And uh, so people actually have built uh, clusters using Ethernet because they didn't want to use uh, something like InfiniBand. That makes it easier to troubleshoot the existing tools work and you can easily route stuff inside of the uh, cluster. The problem there is that this is not that mature and uh, there, uh, it, it still has some, some unusual things going on there. You need specialized gateways. Um, uh, for some of these issues uh, because of Rocky. And also uh, uh, the InfiniBand API or the RDMA API um, assumes that you have a lossless fabric. So there have been standards added to the uh, Ethernet Center called the Data Center Extensions. And in the Data Center Extensions, you can actually make the Ethernet network as also uh, lossless. And only if you do that will Rocky actually work. So this is a bit, of, a bit deceptive. Uh, you may have actually much more effort to get your Ethernet uh, fabric to work than you think. It's not as easy as using simply the uh, Ethernet protocol on a Rocky. Then there's OFE, the uh, new fabric interface. Uh, this is a recent project by the Open Fabrics Alliance to redesign the RDMA API. Uh, it's based on RDMA and driven by Intel. Um, and uh, so, it also allows you to have even more bypass of the kernel. You can, you can put actually the logic to steer the NIC and all of that into a library where you then avoid having to upgrade the uh, kernel when you get a new, a new device driver. And there's still some issues here, like multicast is not there, and which is something that kills our use for our uh, uh, use case here. And then what kind of software actually runs this stuff? Um, EDR with Mellanox Connectix 4 uh, is available in Linux 4.3. Uh, Red Hat 7.2 fully supports that. 
Um, Ethernet via MANUS Connect X4 is, is for Linux 4.5, and 7.3 also supports that with Rocky and everything. There's also some stuff in 7.2, but it's socket, lay socket layer only. You can't do too much with that. Omnipath, uh, in Omnipath you have a lot of tree drivers, in, and they are also in Linux 4.4 staging, and it's currently supported via an out of tree uh, kernel driver from uh, Intel. They're working on that to push it into uh, Red Hat. I'm not quite sure where that is right now. And, but the intention is to, be, uh, to work the same way as the EDI stuff from Mellanox, to be native in the distros. And you want to talk about the tests? Oh, yeah. so, they, they told me to get real close to the uh, microphone, so hopefully <laughs> you, guys can, you guys can hear me. Uh, so this is our, our test setup. Uh, we just had, uh, again, some uh, Omnipath cards, some ConnectX4 cards, and the uh, Omnipath switch, uh, which is like the version one Omnipath, uh, as well as the uh, EDR switch from Mellanox, the uh, SB7700. Uh, for some reason, we decided to put one gig up there. Uh, if you're doing performance with one gig, you may at least move to 10 gig. Uh, as you can see, the uh, latency with uh, one gig is terrible. Uh, so yeah, you should, as, as you can see, um, once you get to the higher packet sizes, uh, one gig is basically uh, worthless. But if you, if you see the uh, 100 gig Ethernet and EDR basically follow the same line, so you got about two, uh, two microsecond latency uh, throughout. Uh, as you can see also Omnipath, because this is their version one, uh, I guess their version one in their, in their, uh, their technology is somewhat higher latency than what you would expect from a, an InfiniBand fabric. And the reason that we look at latency is uh, because for uh, financial data and trading, uh, uh, latency is essential to, um, to this, right? And so the reason that we think it's, it's worthless is because of the extremely high latency that we can get with one gig. Like Ricky Bobby's dad said, if you're not first, you're last. <laughs> Uh, and here you can see you some bandwidth uh, measurements. Uh, it's 100 gig is hard to see, but it basically follows the same line as EDR, which is the blue that is able to go to line rate at 12 gigs, uh, 12 gigs a second. Um, everything, like basically EDR and 100 gig are probably like the best solutions that you can get right now. And, and it seems that speaking to vendors, 100 gig, because it got delayed, uh, 200 gig might never be a thing, because the 400 gig, uh, basically, timeline is slowly coming, coming through. So um, basically, just focus on 100 gig or 400 gig when it becomes available. Uh, again, um, let's see. Uh, if we, have, if we have some. Uh, so uh, most of the stuff that we do in-house is multicast. And these are some of the uh, multicast latency results that we got. Uh, again, Omnipath is, they, they told us uh, not to pay too much attention to these latency results just because they're, they will fix it at some point. Uh, this is what Intel said, so hopefully they, hopefully they do. And then uh, here we have a comparison between uh, RDMA. The RDMA is the same test as we had before, which is uh, IV SendLat, uh, compared to a test uh, that's called UDP ping. Uh, they use the sockets. So as you can see, the uh, yeah the socket latencies are pretty bad. Even with uh, this is the small payload test. Uh, we'll we'll see the big payload test uh, in a second. And so this is the packet being sent just and then wait a while and just see how much how much is the overhead of, of processing, and uh, the yeah the, the kernel has a very high uh, uh, overhead there, and uh, fast processing of packets means that you have to cut the latency down as much as possible. It probably doesn't matter too much, but these are uh, the Ethernet tests are cross-connected, so there's no switch in between. So there might be a little bit of difference once you plug in, like an Arista or a Cisco, or something, something like that. Uh, and this is the uh, big, uh, big packet test. Again, also I don't know why one gig is in there, but just for fun, I guess. Uh, most of the people have one gig network, so I think this comparison is pretty important. <laughs> All right. 
last bits. That's it for the testing. Do you okay. have any questions, just let us know. Okay, so here's some references to more material. The presentation is also on the website, so if you want to find uh, these links and read more about this, you can find it here. Um, then I have some stuff here, what I would like to do in the future with this stuff. I'm trying to organize an RDMA uh, conference uh, and workshop and, and summit right now for the Columbus Conference and Kernel Summit. And so we're going to have a full day talking about the issues that we want to do here on this level. So what I want to do is uh, basically I would like to have a full integration of the RDMA uh, and direct messaging into the net network stack, which has been a contentious issue for the last uh, decade or so. Uh, we really need more easier to use APIs to do this stuff. Um, we need a full integration with the network tools so that we can transparently use these uh, high-speed adapters. And uh, so currently this is more like a sidecar of the kernel, right? So this is, you are in the network stack or you are in the RDMA subsystem in the RDMA subsystem. You have different tools, you have different techniques, but fundamentally messaging is very similar and almost the same between both. So you would like to have this all operate with um, uh, like a regular network device. Uh, the problem is this removes the kernel from the data path, and this has one of the issues with the general network uh, stack developers. But uh, again, already the uh, the flow steering mechanism already takes uh, Nick out of the uh, takes the operations out of the path to some extent, and this is just going further than that. Uh, so I hope we can have some fruitful discussions at the Plumbers Conference to figure out how to get, make this easier to use, because I think this this is there's no way to, to avoid this in the future. Um, so, actually, what I've heard from the vendors is they intend to um, um, start a war now on who has the far fastest uh, network. And every two years now, we're going to double the speed of the networking. And they have an idea in the middle of 20, after 20, 2020s, we're going to end up with one terabit in, uh, to a server. So, uh, if you want to keep up with that uh, in some fa version, fashion, we need to find better ways to deal with this. And uh, so, since we can't increase the speed of the single core anymore to a significant degree, we need to have some other ways to uh, get directly uh, accessed into memory or something. Um, so, with that, um, if you have some more time, if any, any questions, otherwise I have some more material. Yes. The packet is serialized over all four links. Okay. So uh, if, you, if the switch supports it and you can and it can do this over just two links, you get 50 or just one, you get this one. But it's a different modulation then. Well, there's a DSQ logic in the transceivers and stuff. So uh, they've been working on this for a while. <laughs> okay, the question is what is the best practice of setting the MTU for 100 gigabit? Well, this depends on what you want to do with it. If you want to transition to regular Ethernet fabrics that have a 1500 bytes, which is typical, then you can't do nothing. You just get stuck with a 1500 byte uh, approach. Otherwise, of course, it's advantageous to have jumbo frames, uh, main 9K frames. Uh, but as far as I know, all uh, deployments that I've seen are at 1.5K for the MTU size. Pardon? Yes. Well, the reason that, that, that 9K is not used that much is because we now have a lot stateless offload in the kernel. This means uh, you can give a 64K frame to the kernel, and the NIC will uh, notice, okay, this is 64K, I have to hack this into pieces and send 1,500 bytes a piece. And so if there is a gear at the other end that can recognize the situation, it can reassemble the 64K frame. Otherwise, it's just regular gear that will forward the 1,500 byte frames. So and on Ethernet, this is not that critical anymore. On On Ethernet, typically it's 1500 bytes or 9K. Uh, 
I think 9 meg, 9K, 9K. No, larger than 9K. No. On Infinity Band, you have 64K. Oh. So you can get graded to extremely large frames on that level, but uh, uh, as far as I can see, it, this is, they are all fed with 1500 bytes and the stateless offload, and even 9, 9K is not used that much, so I would be skeptical if, I, if you want to try it, and that you may be running into issues there. The 1500 uh, bytes is pretty standard, and especially if you want to reach the internet and stuff, you cannot avoid that. And most applications at some point hit the net. Any other? XDB? Oh, I haven't. I haven't looked at that in detail, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was asking if I could comment on XDP, which is a new technique uh, to kind of avoid the doorbell issues and, and stuff, and I haven't looked at that. It also didn't come up in any of the standard nicks that we had, and we tried to run be as uh, run off the mill as possible without getting too much bogged down into details of uh, kernel stuff. Speed, yeah. Well, I know that there's plans on the book to uh, double this, uh, triple this, and uh, quadruple this any further. So they're probably going to go to 50 gig uh, CDS and 100 gig CDS as soon as they can. And that is uh, their hope that they, with that they can double and quadruple the speed again. And so we have two major companies, Intel and Mellanox, waging this war right now. Who gets there first? And because they see this is a major uh, issue for uh, connected clusters and for the machine learning, and everybody wants machine learning. Yeah. What kind of At 100 gig, it depends what you want to do. If you want to do large transfers into memory, that's easy. You don't have to process the data. You just transfer it into memory, and then you have some other slow process that takes the memory and does something with it, while more memory is being filled up with something else. It depends on how many cores you have and what these cores are doing, and if they have, actually have to touch the data. When you have to touch the data, you get into the slowness. But if you can just forward the pointer to the, to the memory to some other external accelerator or external unit, then it's very easy. If you, why don't I have what? It's going to be slow, yes, because the UDP means it's first going to stream into the 1.5K buffer in the kernel, <laughs> which then the segments are copied over to your, to, to your user space, and that is uh, pretty slow. And uh, the memory uh, is actually the, the boundary here, uh, which is the next slide. <laughs> yeah, we actually can get into memory performance issues here. <laughs> so 100 gig can give you 12.5 gigabyte per second, right? Of throughput. And DDR memory config and space configuration is at 6.5 gigabit per second. So um, high end can be 17 gigabyte per second. So uh, DDI3 memory is not suitable for uh, 100 gig networking. Uh, DDR4 can't get you there. You can directly stream into the DDR4 memory range and you can actually sustain that. So you gotta be careful what you buy. If you buy DDR3 and put 100 gig in there, well, there's gonna be uh, the inability to actually deliver the stuff onto memory. And now we also have the adapters which have dual 100 gig connectors. So actually you can already do 200 gig, which is you can, if you have two sockets, you can have two processors and each has their memory subsystem. You may make sure that one string goes to one processor's memory and the other one to the others. There's all these, these problems that may arise. So um, actually, and the question is also what happens if you saturate the memory subsystem with a transfer that takes you a couple of seconds. Uh, can the system still do anything or does it just fail over, fall over? We haven't tested that, but it may be very interesting to see. More questions? Let's see if I have anything else here. Do yeah, looking ahead here, we, we, I think 100 gigs maturing and it's gonna be very rolled out. We have 200 gig available 2017, 2018, as promised by both vendors. Uh, and they want terabyte links by 2022. Maybe they're just making promises and they're trying to up and one another and this is what they do. But uh, So the software really needs to, mat to mature. We need uh, OS network stack to, hand to handle the speeds. 
We have to proper APIs, deal with the memory throughput issues, and have, you have a need to have a deeper integration of CPU and memory. There's some thoughts that maybe we should just directly put the uh, network connection onto the die and have the processor directly in the L1 and L2 caches deal with this. At some point, when you can't reach memory anymore at this speed, this may make sense. L1, L2 cache is faster, so you may be able to operate at that level in a much faster way and then be selective of what you actually commit to memory. But for that, you need to have new processor architectures that can handle this stuff. Which brings me to the end. Okay, uh, if anybody wants to get involved, please talk to me. We're gonna, again, we have these meetings at the Kernel Summit and Plumbers Conference to talk about these issues and uh, trying to find ways to improve the situation here. And uh, we have also have an extra meeting outside of the uh, Kernel Summit and uh, Plumbers Conference on the following Saturday to deal with issues that we haven't been able to get through during our day at the Plumbers Conference in Santa Fe. So, um, we also have a mailing list, the Linux RDM mailing list on VGRKernel.org if you're interested to see what's going on there. So I'd love to have more people involved on this one. Any more questions? Yes. 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 It's not there, no, sorry. <laughs> That's why we are saying we are hoping for OmniPath version 2, which comes out next spring. And uh, the, the Intel has this connector to the chip. They have the right idea. Um, the question is when are we getting there? And uh, the, the, the problem is also, I've tried to look into this in more detail. I attended the Photonics Conference at MIT uh, a year ago, and I've had a series of Photonics specialists say what Intel says is absolute nonsense can never be done because the Photonics process is different from the regular processor process. You can never integrate the chip with the... Uh, with the, with the main processor. So what I'm seeing now is there's two chips on the, on the package, one for the network hookup and one for the processor, and they are linked now with PCI Express. So we're still hoping for the best in the, in the future, but uh, we're observing the situation, and hopefully we'll have something useful at some point. Okay, if there are not any, not, no more questions, then thank you all for coming. Um, talk to me later if you want. <laughs>